Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. I am so grateful to all of you who have been tuning in and hopefully you've been digging all these conversations that we've been having about the Beatles. Um, today I have a special guest, Sean Ross, who has a newsletter called Ross on Radio. And he's had a career of 40 years working in the business. And the reason why I want to have him on here is because in my whole background, for the most part, has been working in radio. Um, I started back in 1981 uh, on college radio and uh, just recently celebrated my 40th anniversary doing my Beatles show called Every Little Thing. But most of the work that I've done on the air has been on the radio. And it wasn't until 2009 that I started getting involved with podcasts. And I'm really amazed at how the podcast world has taken off to the extent that a lot of people know me more for the podcast that I do, like things we said today and Talk More Talk and this channel, than the work I've done on every little thing. And so, you know, I wanted to have a conversation and I may have more conversations on this very subject because I'm concerned about the status of radio, how important it still is. Um, and so Sean, I thought would be the perfect guest to have on. Um, like I said, 40 years in the business, he started work at one of the most respectable radio publications, Radio and Records, uh, back in 1983. Um, he was a report taker and then later an editor for, he was the R&B associate editor at Radio and Records. He then moved on to Billboard magazine. He was a radio editor there for four years. He also worked with, um, he did uh, working in, in airplay and monitoring that. He did that for eight years. And his newsletter, Ross on Radio, um, has been around for the past decade. Since 2003, he's been working with radio stations as a researcher for Edison Research and also as an independent consultant. And um, he's worked for radio stations around the world and in every format. Um, and the one thing about Ross on Radio is it's everything you'd want to know about what's going on in radio today. What formats are working, what's not working, what's the new hot station in a certain area, what songs still get airplay, which songs don't get airplay. So I couldn't have a more perfect guest to welcome to our show. Sean, welcome to Ken Michaels Radio. Thanks, Ken. Always happy to talk about radio. Thanks for the kind words. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it was such a long introduction, but um, we will be talking a little bit uh, about your memories of the Beatles on the radio, whether you want to talk about the group years or the solo years. But I want to start the conversation with a simple but very powerful question, in your opinion, based on all the work you've done in the research, is radio as popular today as it once was. And before you answer that question, we also have to specify something here because usually when, when I think of radio, I think of terrestrial radio, FM and AM. But these days, you've also got satellite radio and you've got internet radio and you've got HD radio. So how, how would you respond to that question about the popularity? And you could break it down if you want to in, in all those different types of radio and how it's presented. Is it as popular as it once was? Radio is diminished, but not demolished. Uh, and it's a, there's a difference. Um, you know, radio is certainly not the only place people find music, and it doesn't have you know a forty share. You know, of, you know, the top forty station doesn't have a forty share like it did in 1967. Uh, and if that's your baseline, it's not that. Um, you know, um, radio was, you know, pretty much, you know, my whole world, you know, beyond friends and family in mm. high school, college, the first 15 years of my career. Um, and there are still, you know, a handful of kids to whom it's that and they're the ones who are going into radio now but they are at this point clearly the exception that said um 
I think radio, in terms of doing what radio does, will always be important. But I do think you have to, at the very least, count Sirius XM as radio. Um, you know, I don't think in terms of terrestrial, because, you know, that's from their press kit. Um, I think in terms of broadcast radio, satellite radio, um, and, you know, and then the other things that people use, like radio, um, there will always be radio. There will always be somebody programming music for you. Um, whether it's an FM broadcaster, whether it's the people who currently own today's FM radio stations, is another question. Um, you know, because those are the people who are challenged. Those are the people who can seem to get away from running 10 minutes of commercials an hour or 12 or 15. Hmm. Those are the people who have problems with streaming. Those are the people who don't have the staff to do the things their radio does well. Um, but Amazon might, you know, might choose to do some of those things eventually, or Spotify might choose to have DJs. Uh, and when they do, they'll call it radio and it will be um, and it will be an obvious successor to AM FM broadcast radio that we grew up on. It just hasn't taken shape yet. That's what you foresee in the future. Yeah, you know, I hope that, you know, I hope the iHearts or the Odysseys find themselves, you know, a franchise doing that. But, um, you know, if our current broadcasters don't do that, somebody will. And, you know, again, I already count, you know, Sirius XM as radio because um, it does what radio does. Sometimes it sounds more like classic radio um, than FM radio. Right. Is is radio, again, I'm going to say terrestrial, are they still influential in record sales as they once were? Well, I mean, there aren't record sales. Um, you know, as people, you know, I still choose to own music, but as people choose to rent not buy music. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they continue to set the agenda eventually. Um, they don't start records um, as much as they used to, but something doesn't become a consensus hit until radio comes in. Uh, for everything you read about, we don't talk about Bruno. Um, you know, five weeks at number one, mm -hmm. um, you know, even before radio came along, uh, that song was not Bill Eugene. That song was not Uptown Funk. You know, that song was not Take On Me. That song was not a consensus hit. You know, it was a phenomenon that a lot of people loved, but it wasn't at the level of radio hit. And the problem is, you know, between even when streaming and radio a lot, there aren't a lot of songs now that become take on me. Right. Yeah. Well, I've gotten used to the whole idea when I look at the charts that it's a combination of physical sales and streaming. You know, to me, it's still you're, you're choosing to hear a certain song. And when you do that, that contributes to where these songs are placed on the charts. But, you know, it's a different world, at least to me, when I grew up and I listened to the radio and they introduced all this music to me. How do young people these days discover new music if no one's presenting it to them and they have to seek it out themselves? That's a whole other approach. Well, I mean, you know, quiet as it's kept, um, you know, they still do hear radio, but, you know, but it's the thing that's on in the car. 
um, you know, and not the thing that they choose to represent. Hmm. Um, but, you know, radio does still put songs in front of people, but when you spend, you know, a half hour a day and not four hours a day, um, you hear them eventually. Right. Um, we and again, you know, it's not like streaming. Um, you know, streaming is not getting you number one records by itself. Streaming is getting you number 18 records by itself. You know, what streaming is, you know, what streaming is getting you, um, you know, to put it in terms that people, you know, our age would understand, um, you know, is Sweetheart by Frankie and the Knockouts. The song that you know we remember growing up that was almost a hit. The song we heard on American Top 40. The song uh -huh. our generation remembers. Um, you know, but it was never quite a power and it never quite went to the oldies library. Um, you know, and it's not, you know, a record everybody remembers and it won't be in the pandemic you know, next to Take On Me. Streaming doesn't get you Take On Me by itself. Streaming gets you real life. Send me an angel. Um, okay. You know, and if someone's going, if someone's out there going, I've never heard of the two records you just named. That's the point. Oh, I've heard of both of them. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. You know, but somebody 10 years younger than us, right. or you know, 25 years younger, might or might not have. Um, and uh, again, streaming feeds the culture. You know, it doesn't control it. And to some extent, nothing does. You know, when I listened growing up to Top 40, which was my life in the 60s and 70s, and also in the 80s, being brought up on WABC in New York City, in particular, 99X in New York City, you know, I'm very much aware that Top 40 became what a lot of people, well, for many years now, 40 years, have called contemporary hit radio. And if the youngest, if, if your demographic is really very young for that, which it always has been, is radio still attracting a young enough audience for a hit oriented station? You know, if, if you're saying that that kind of format goes up to say, was it supposed to be age 34 from little kids to 34? Um, it's, it's my personal opinion that, you know, the, the base of the people who listen to radio these days are people who grew up with it and an older demographic. So I'm just wondering when it comes to hit records in particular, you know, is there enough of an audience, young, a young audience still listening to radio? Nothing made older listeners happier 10 years ago when radio was healthier and top 40 was healthy. Nothing made those older listeners happier than having a lot of current music that they can share with their kids and, you know, and bond with their kids over. Uh, and there was Pink, there was Party Rock Anthem, there was Taylor Swift, and eventually that kind of record went away. Um, when there is music that the moms like again, the kids will follow because the moms will be more enthusiastic about putting the radio on in the car. They don't want to listen to classic hits forever. You know, they mm -hmm. listen to those songs. They still like some of those songs. They don't only want to listen to those songs. Uh, and they want something to talk to their kids about, and they don't want their kids to be under the headphones, under the earbuds, you know, listening to rap caviar without them. They want to have that moment. You know, music is what people have in common. Um, you know, and if you don't have that with your kids, you know, it's one less tool, hmm. you know, for being able to communicate with your kids. So um, the people who grew up with radio would be happy to model it for their kids if only radio played something they like. <laughs> um, 
you know, and right now, you know, what we have is music that is, you know, not quite hip enough for the kid under the earbuds and, you know, not quite melodic enough, you know, for the 41-year-old woman, you know, driving the carpool. Is there you know, enough? And, you know, for the last two years, she hasn't been driving the carpool, but, you know, now the carpool's up and running again, hmm. um, you know, and we don't have the records, you know, for, you know, for the road trip yet. I'm trying to break things down between all the different ways you're going to be exposed to music and especially new music. And whether it's terrestrial radio, whether it's streaming it on Spotify or streaming services, is there, um, are there enough studies that determine when it comes to discovering new artists and music, how much radio does play a part compared to those streaming services? Because, you know, I, I, I really want to know, is, is Spotify and the streaming services, are they leading the way? when it comes to, and I, I know you've been talking about sharing the music with your family and your parents and all that on the radio, but I just want to have a feel for still how important radio is now, especially terrestrial radio. But, um, you know, because I, I keep hearing all the time that, that young people don't really listen that much to the radio. I don't want to be proven wrong. Believe me, Sean. So well, um, it's not Spotify only; it's YouTube. Uh, right? People don't realize you know, mm. how much of an impact YouTube has in introducing people to music. Um, and you know, YouTube Music as a streaming service you know is growing as well. Do you um, think that's more powerful than radio? It, certainly, for some demos. You know, for some demos, you know, radio, again, is not out of the picture, but it's, you know, it's, you know, 20 percent, you know, it's not the 60 or 70 percent it would have been, you know, a decade ago. Okay. Um, you know, for older adults, you know, it's radio, it's streaming, it's friends and family. Mm -hmm. Um you know, for my wife, it's you know, probably Sirius XM, the spectrum. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and she knows those songs before I do, typically. You know, because she spends, you know, enough time with it, whereas, you know, I'm distributing my time, you know, between 10,000 stations. Mm -hmm. So... Talk a little bit about other platforms like TuneIn, the fact that you can listen to individual stations through streaming different parts of the world. Has that really benefited individual stations or are individual stations still more local and most of their listeners are local? You know, I think individual stations should be taking better advantage of it. Uh, tune in or iHeart have, you know, a big job organizing 3,000 stations, 4,000 stations, 10,000 stations. Um, Sirius XM gives you, you know, 150 main channels, you know, more through the app. Um, and it's, you know, easier to negotiate. Um, you know, it's hard to find even your locals. Uh, in the streaming world, unless you're looking for them, just like it's hard to find new podcasts. Mm. Um, you know, podcasts, you know, have the momentum and have the psychological advantage, but, you know, the number one thing you hear eventually about podcasts is how hard it is for new ones to be found. Um, you know, so imagine, and podcasts want to be found. Um, you know, if you're, um, you know, if you're a local radio station, <clears throat> if you're a local radio station, um, you're not even necessarily seeking, um, you know, an international audience out. 
Uh, and if you've got 10 minutes of spots and you know those 10 minutes are filled with bad PSAs, um, you're not necessarily even the best choice for the local listener. Okay. Um, you know, that said, um, some stations, you know, especially those that are unique, WXPN Philadelphia, uh, WAKY in Louisville, um, WAKY is, you know, an oldie station that, you know, plays more songs than the average. Uh, they still play the 60s. Um, they have, you know, they had an international streaming audience and, you know, they didn't know how to make money doing mm. that. So they geo-blocked it. And, you know, now you can only hear them if you're a local. Um, there are a lot of stations that could have, you know, a worldwide franchise and they don't know how to pursue that yet. Mm. You know, you're hitting on a topic here. Um, very often on my podcast shows, I do bring up radio and the fact that, you know, radio stations want to attract a younger audience. Once you reach a certain age, I believe it's 54, they don't seem to care about that audience. And so for that reason, if you were brought up on oldies radio and you were used to hearing 60s or even the 50s music, times have moved on. Yeah. Many radio stations won't play the 60s. And even there's some, well, it's, it's broken down to not necessarily an oldie station, but what they call classic hits and classic hits can be anywhere from the seventies on up or the eighties on up and classic rock also um, plays very little sixties. They may have a Beatles show on the weekend, but if they do play any sixties, it's always late sixties and a very small sampling of that. And even, you know, they're not playing as much seventies music as they once did. So what are your feelings about that? And I think a lot of people wanted to turn to satellite radio because they know they can rely on hearing 60s yeah. music on the 60s on six or, you know, hearing a classic rock station that's still going to play 60s and 70s music. So, you know, I think satellite radio has addressed that, but also internet radio has as well. So how do you feel on yeah, that subject? Um, you can find 60s and, you know, early 70s if you're looking um, you know, maybe you won't hear as many of them on K Earth in Los Angeles or CBS mm -hmm. FM. Um, you know, one of the great things, you know, about 10,000 stations uh, is that you can find the one you want, you know, and I can't get to them all. Mm -hmm. um, it's. Um, there are, you know, there are classic hit stations that play Lady Gaga. Um, you know, there are classic hit stations that, you know, are practically light FM in terms of, you know, spanning 79 through 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine, but um, if you're a classic hit station, you're basically, even if you're playing the 80s, you're playing it for people who weren't there. People like Summer of 69, people like Don't You Forget About Me, but they heard those songs as oldies. They didn't hear them as currents increasingly because um, they're kids of the 90s. So why would they be hung up on hearing the Beatles? They didn't grow up with Simple Minds or the Beatles. You know, where is the part of them that says, I like both those songs, I will dance to both of them at the bat mitzvah, but one is too old. <laughs> um, you know, at this point, if I were a classic hit station, you know, I would test a younger audience and then I would play all of the songs um, that, you know, are all time great songs for them. And some of, you know, a few of those are going to be from the 60s, you know, a lot more are going to be from the 80s, but uh, just, you know, because of recency. Um, but, you know, songs come back out of nowhere, you know, especially with TikTok. 
somebody had to know love grows where my rosemary goes, you know, for it to become a viral phenomenon. You know, right. maybe they thought in shallow hell, maybe somebody's parents played it for them. You know, maybe it was just Exotica and a bunch of MP3s, but, you know, they don't care it's from 71. They don't care that it was a studio group. Um, you know, it's just another song out of many songs on the Cosmic Jukebox. Right. Look at what um, happened with Dreams. Completely yeah. Wrong. You know, and, you know, I'm happier to have Edison Lighthouse back because, you know, I've heard Dreams enough, but, mm -hmm. you know, for one lifetime. But, you know, just like I've heard Simple Minds enough for one lifetime. But, uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, um, you know, I love rumors and I'm glad that happened to stay in front of people. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about internet radio? Has it grown a lot in recent um, years? You know, again, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about somebody's, you know, semi-professional radio station, um, you know, there are a lot of those. Um, and like podcasts, it's hard to get noticed. Hmm. Um, if you can't afford jocks, um, you know, if you can only host one day part yourself, um, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to compete. Um, it's basically your mixtape with jingles. That said, um, and, you know, I realize, you know, um, you know, I have a lot of readers who have that type of station, and I do spend a lot of time with those stations, um, and I should spend more, and, you know, especially when it's somebody who comes from FM radio, you know, I'm always curious, you know, about what they do. Bobby Rich was, you know, on San Diego and Tucson radio for 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he's back on Tucson radio. He's doing a station called The Drive that, you know, the people who are watching this podcast uh, will love if they haven't discovered it already. For a while, he was doing an internet station. Um, you know, he couldn't afford other jobs. Um, but it was always Bobby Rich. It's, you know, it's the same sensibilities now that he's, you know, back on AM FM radio. Um, you know, he always knew what he knew. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yes, there's a lot of internet radio. It's, you know, I wish that, um, I don't think the big companies take, you know, sufficient advantage of its possibilities. I don't think the people who, you know, most um, want to be in the space have the resources. And, you know, I hope that people find some work around because otherwise uh, it is going to be Apple Music or Google or Amazon or somebody who finally develops internet radio to its fullest i certainly hope uh, but that i'd happens. rather it yeah. be the people who have some you know some resident history of radio yeah i certainly hope that uh that internet radio grows because i know in the case of many of the radio stations that carry my syndicated beetle show every little thing a lot of their programming is very innovative and it's stuff that you're not likely to hear on terrestrial radio but just like podcasting, like you said, it's a lot of work getting the word out there and for your audience to grow. But I think kind of like podcasting, um, your audience is very loyal. Was well, they get hooked and, on to you? Know, you know, the, um, the Grail uh, are stations like US 41 radio in Florida that have, you know, some hosting and have, you know, a unique mix and some sponsors. Um, you know, those are the moments where you listen and go, okay, maybe you don't need a stick. Hmm. You know, at this moment, you know, a stick is, you know, an organizing principle. 
being found on FM you know, radio is an organizing principle. Um, you know, AM, FM radio depended on that simplicity. You know, Sirius XM has that simplicity. Um, and beyond that, it's the wild, wild west. And, you know, it has to be you and me searching out that type of station. Right. Well, that's the genius of Sirius XM is that it's easy to navigate. You know, yeah, otherwise well, that's a big deal. Yeah. There's a, enough people out there, out there that want to discover interesting radio stations and formats that they think they would enjoy, but they don't know how to go about looking for it. So, but it's right right there on Sirius XM, it's all spelled out for you. So let's talk a little bit about the Beatles here. Um, I've certainly spent a lot of time analyzing radio airplay of the Beatles in the last 40 plus years since I've got involved um, doing my show. And um, it's a bit disconcerting when it comes to terrestrial radio that, um, you know, like I said, a lot of classic rock and oldie stations don't play. I mean, there are some, if you know which ones they are, that play 60s music, but you don't hear as much, in my opinion, right. uh, of, of Beatles music group and solo on the radio because of their wanting a younger demographic, even though there's always new fans and young fans discovering the Beatles. So for me, um, Apart from if the radio station has a, a weekly Beatles show, usually on the weekends, you don't hear too much of the Beatles. And what you do hear is a very small sampling of their catalog and especially their solo catalog. Right. And, you hear Hey Jude onward. Yeah. You know, maybe you hear Penny Lane uh -huh. onward. Um, you know, it usually starts with, you know, with Sergeant Pepper or thereabouts. Um, and, you know, again, like, you know, like a 14 year old knows. Like a 14 year old says, you know, a song from 68 is, you know, contemporary to me and a song from 66 is, you know, is ancient. <laughs> I, that always boggles my mind. You know, I, I, I wish sometimes that whether a song sounds contemporary shouldn't matter all that much because there's a lot of stuff that Beatles did on the, their Revolver album that sounds like it could have been done today, as far as I'm concerned. You I know? had a group program director tell me the Beatles, you know, sounded, you know, the production sounded old to him. Hmm. And I've heard many, you know, complaints about, you know, many thoughts on, you know, whether you should play the Beatles, you know, basically because people are just looking at their slide rule for, you know, how old the people are who remember those songs in real time. But, you know, the one thing I've never heard that George Martin sounds dated. Hmm. Yeah, until this person said it. Right. No, I, I, I've i done, and two times I did a show with the same theme, which is that every time a Beatles album appears on the charts, on Billboard's album charts, it's always from Sgt. Pepper on, with the exception of the Beatles one, which has early stuff represented, and I wanted to know why. And I have had people write to me saying that early Beatles music the earliest stuff does sound dated so and you know it's to me that's it 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 shouldn't matter that's just how i feel because most you know, of the music I mean, to you know and, to a lot of people twist yeah. and shout is you know is from 1986 right um you know same as you know same as stand by me mm -hmm. And shouldn't it matter somewhat to people who program radio that the Beatles archival box sets, Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, Abbey Road, Let It Be, all did very well on the album charts. They all made the top 10. You know, I think that's really impressive for, for albums that are more than 50 years old. You know, I schedule a classic hits radio station and you know, I, you know, sit there and schedule the music and, you know, after, you know, over Thanksgiving, you know, I called my program director and said, we should be covered for Monday, right? You know, we should have, you know, extra Beatles all day, right? And fortunately, she agreed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how everybody didn't come out of Get Back 
you know, as a TV event and do that. Um, the only excuse, um, you know, is, you know, if you had the Beatles already and you went back and put in some Billy Preston songs, um, you know, because, you know, Billy got, you know, a career boost, you know, from, from that show too. Mm -hmm. um, Beatles, you know, should be, you know, Beatles are many people's intro to oldies. You know, Beatles, you know, are the first thing in the eternal jukebox that many kids hear. Mm. So um, you would think that the station that wants to, you know, rec the station that wants to draw a younger audience, um, you would think that Beatles would be the place they start. Um, Beatles were not the first group I knew growing up. Right. I grew up in Washington, D.C. My dad worked at an R&B radio station. I knew who the Supremes were first, mm -hmm. you know, but not for long. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I love all kinds of music. And even though I think the Beatles are the greatest band there ever was, and they had the most successful solo careers of all time, which I don't think they get enough credit for. I love so many other styles of music and so many other artists that I just don't, I never could relate to the years when the music came out and that how that should even matter to people today growing up. You can get into music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. You know, it shouldn't just be the new music of today or just, you know, maybe what your parents grew up with or what you barely got to know when you were a kid you know I, I just i know it sounds crazy but to me it's always been there's only good music and bad music <laughs> you so, know when i grew up um when yeah, when the four seasons had their comeback you know frankie valley had his hmm. comeback in 75 and the four seasons followed right. I had no idea they'd ever been cold because WABC played so much Four Seasons Gold uh -huh. that you know I had you know no idea that they ever were not superstars um, in New York City, you know, and you know I didn't particularly know that you know all those songs were ten years old and you know they hadn't had a hit in eight years. Same thing with the Bee Gees. You know, I mean, they had so many hits in the 60s through the early 70s, and they had, say, three years there when they didn't have any hits. But yeah, in, in 1973, I saw, uh, you know, when the Sonny and Cher TV show was hot, hmm. you know, I saw Cher do all I really want to do. Um, you know, and I knew Dylan, but I didn't know his LP cuts. And, right. You know, I thought, what is this new Cher song? You know, <laughs> this is great. How come I haven't heard it on the radio? Right. You know, maybe it'll be the next single, you know, after, you know, after Dark Lady runs its course. Mm. Um, you know, it was just a good new song to me. You kind of, in a way, answered this ne next question, but I'm still going to pose it anyway, because you were saying how some of the hits of today may not have the same impact of hits from the past that were really huge hits back then. But, um, you know, very often it's mentioned that the first week of April 1964, the Beatles held the top five positions in America and they had 14 singles and hot, the Hot 100. And in recent years, you've got people like Justin Bieber or Drake having many singles on the charts simultaneously, all coming from their latest albums. And how do you feel about that? Does that really mean anything to you on the charts when you have an artist do something similar to what the Beatles did? Of course, you know, they're just putting out the songs digitally. So, you know, um, they're accomplishing the same thing that the Beatles did, but yet, as far as I'm concerned, who knows in the future if any of these artists will have the same impact as 
the Beatles or other artists that we grew up with. But how do you feel about that when an accomplishment is made today that's similar to what was done in the past with the charts? You know, the chart measure is different things now. Um, you know, the most comparable um, story in, you know, Beatles 64 is Tony Sheridan, My Body. You know, that was, you know, a record that, you know, probably wasn't on the radio much that sold because it was Beatles adjacent. You know, that's the, you know, equivalent of, you know, six Justin Bieber album cuts charting, you know, or, <laughs> you know, or 20 songs from season two of Glee. Um, you know, and, you know, the Beatles could have had a lot more of those, obviously, if the charts had been different in, you know, any year between 64 and, you know, and 70. Yeah, um, as I've, I've often said that for all, for the way the, the Beatles dominated the singles charts in 64, they could have just as easily continued very much in the years that followed. But there was this huge onslaught in 1964 and this catching up with their previous music um yeah i also you know to... the other thing that wouldn't happen now um you know is that you know no record label would spend 10 cents promoting you know even you know the hottest contemporary artist um if they weren't signed to them anymore you know, it was, you know, it was, you know, fortunate that it was a different time in the business. It's, you know, the thing that kept Swan and, you know, and VJ, um, you know, going at the time. But, um, you know, at this moment, you know, we wouldn't see anybody going back to dig in the crates, you know, that way. All right. Before I end our conversation, can you speak of any particular memories that you have of hearing the Beatles on the radio or there's any of their solo tunes? What stands out from, you know, your life as a radio listener? Um, first, what I remember is all you need is love. Um, and it actually, you know, at age four and a half, you know, the horns scared me. <laughs> um, Someone gave me that record and I made them take it back and get me, if you know what I mean by the turtles. So even then I was going for the deep cuts. Okay, well, that's cool. Um, you know, Lady Madonna is probably the first one I liked. Um, but, you know, my daughter, um, you know, her transition from kids music was, Miley Cyrus and the Jonas Brothers and one day I said to her hey you want to hear this group that's even bigger than the Jonas Brothers <laughs> you know I remember you know the old line about George Martin's daughter you know asking you know from the Hollywood Bowl line I would say you know asking if the Beatles were bigger than the Bay City Rollers <laughs> I said want to hear this band that's even bigger than the Jonas Brothers even bigger than One Direction. Um, and, you know, we played, you know, I played her day tripper, um, you know, and I'm, um, you know, and she said, I like the guitar riff. Uh -huh. and, you know, I had never been more proud and, you know, particularly also proud that it wasn't Octopus's Garden. <laughs> What's wrong with Octopus's Garden? <laughs> or Yellow Submarine. <laughs> well, the usual points of entry for little kids. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I see we are getting out there. Um, from my perspective, I always remember, you know, especially 1964, when I, I was first introduced to the Beatles through I Want to Hold Your Hand. I don't remember the precise moment, but just constant airplay of Beatles wall to wall, especially the first half of 1964. And then you also had all the the artists who I didn't really know as much at the time were connected with them, like Peter and Gordon or Billy J. Kramer or, or those artists. But um, yeah, any memories of, of the solo years that stand out, you know, any hit records or albums hearing them on the radio? You know, um, you know, fall 73, spring 74, when, you know, everybody was out there, you know, at the same time. 
mm-hmm. um, you know, which is, you know, the center, you know, it, you know, which is, you know, sixth grade for me, fifth and sixth grade. So, right. you know, it's, you know, it's a central year, you know, for music for a lot of people. So, um, you know, and at that point, um, you know, it would, it, I mean, what I specifically remember is, you know, the moment when, you know, Ringo was having more hits for a moment than everybody. Hmm. Um, you know, and people looked at, you know, people looked at the solo stuff, you know, through a different filter, you know, Ringo having any hits was exciting. You know, Ringo had fun, lightweight hits, and it was a big accomplishment. Paul had fun lightweight hits and it was considered you know a squandering of his talents for a couple of years i think people you know, look at it differently people, <laughs> yeah um so you know it was interesting i mean again they were still you know in 73 74 the number one you know image artist in america um you know i certainly they certainly meant more to me than Zeppelin did. You know, they may not have meant more to me at that point than R and B did. You know, which you know, which you know, was another big part you know of my radio childhood. Sure. Um, yeah. Hey, the the seventies to me was a magical time for R and B, which we should well, do a yeah, separate and, show yeah, on that. For, <laughs> yeah, and for straight ahead pop. Um, yeah. You know, and, you know, at that, that point, of course, you know, I was hearing, you know, the Beatles filter through everybody else. Um, you know, every, it's funny, I mean, even Madman had, you know, even Madman had a subplot along this line, you know, you know, parents who, you know, couldn't discern one type of contemporary music from another. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when Jingle Jangle by the Arches was out, you know, my dad turned to, you know, turned to us and went, it sounds like the Beatles. And, you know, even at seven, I was going, how, how does this in any way sound like the Beatles? But, you know, if, you know, your frame of reference was everything before 64 and everything after, it probably did. Hmm. Yeah, the Beatles influenced so many artists in many ways that we still haven't even discovered yet. Um, so if people want to find out more about your newsletter, Ross on Radio, how can they do so? Uh, best thing is to follow me on Twitter in my bio. There's a link to the newsletter. Uh, it's Ross on Radio, all one word. Um, you know, and that's the best place to find me on Twitter or on Spotify. Um, if you are trying to keep up with today's music, uh, I have a playlist that called Big Hits Energy that plays, you know, new music that I think people our age would enjoy. Hit music, uh-huh. but, you know, hit music that has, you know, hooks and tempo and melodies you know plus a lot of vintage playlists including the 60s mm-hmm. are you a fan of triple a radio yeah i'm a fan of you know great triple a stations you know like you know the peak in westchester like yes. you know wxpn in philly right um, you mentioned you know and i appreciate you know that that's where you you know that's where you hear new music um you know what i want is you know a station um i mean triple a stations you know basically choose from a couple of genres you know and it's expanded and it's a lot of things but it's not contemporary pop um you know what i try to do with the playlist and the station you know that i wish i could hear is the station that plays contemporary pop for somebody with my generation sensibilities, Hmm. somebody who likes hooks and melodies, somebody who likes tempo, somebody who likes hearing harmony, somebody who likes hearing the A section and the B section converge in the last 30 seconds of the song. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound like an old fogey. And, uh, you know, I grew up on 60s and 70s and 80s pop. And I'm very proud of that. And there were very well constructed songs from so many different types of artists out there that uh, I wish that I heard would hear more of that on 
contemporary hit radio today. I hear it on AAA, you know, but that's also more more in the rock genre. Not as much poppy to me, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, we opinion. have you know we have a new Harry Styles single that uh -huh. sounds like you know Take on Me, and you know we have another Harry Styles album coming and you know harry styles is you know kind of the, the artist who you know bridges triple a and pop interesting so he you know he has a pop image but he thinks you know he wants to be a triple a artist and you know his you know influences are you know very clearly 60s you know 70s and the whole history hmm. so um you know i'm looking forward to that you know this summer Okay, yeah, and I, I generally look forward to hearing what you know what the new music is. You know, every summer, you know, I still care about the song of summer. I still write about the song of summer. Um, you know, I still think that's you know a place where people come together and pay attention to current pop music. You know, even if they're you know even if they're not in touch with it. And that's why it's so important to have somebody like you do that. You know, yeah, well, I, I, I still want to discover new music of any genre, as far as I'm concerned. But well, uh, and, you know, again, um, you know, I am not willing to, you know, to consign radio to not discovering new music until, um, you know, until, you know, we have something, you know, that, you know, something elsewhere in the Internet that does that. Um, you know, because we don't have, you know, somebody that's hosted and, you know, has the power to break records. Um, you know, Spotify today's top hits is the closest in terms of having that kind of cultural impact and people checking them every Friday to see what's new. But, you know, I want to hear it with a jock and, you know, I don't want to hear, you know, you know, I don't want to hear a podcast in between. I want to hear somebody over the intros. And, you know, I understand if, you know, a 16-year-old doesn't care as much about that. Um, but there are 16-year-olds who will like that when they hear it again. That is something I miss about radio, too. Because, like you um, said... You know, it's, um, you know, hitting the post is, you know, the ultimate old radio person's indulgence and yet um, in 1981 Mike Joseph put on hot hits in Philadelphia and it was as old and corny as a radio station could be and it was an instant success doing hmm. the same thing he did in 1958. So you, you know, think but, that could work but, today? But, you think that could work today? I want somebody to try. <laughs> I'll listen. You know, I can't guarantee, uh, you know, I can't guarantee if a 12 year old will listen to it and go, this is ridiculous. You know, who, who could have liked this? Maybe they will. Um, you know, it's going to pain me if, you know, if it takes another 10 years to happen, uh, you know, somewhere, you know, from Apple Music or somebody while, you know, FM broadcasters just let the opportunity sit there. Yeah, well, there's more to being a DJ than just hitting the post, although I see it as as quite an art. And when when my kids are in the car with me and there's a friend that I have who grew up on WABC and hitting the post all the time, they find it annoying. Why are you stepping over the song? And that's how they look at it. But, you know, I miss personality driven radio. And when you just have a morning jock and an afternoon jock and then you've got voice tracking the rest of the day or just um automation it loses something so you know i listened to ks95 in minneapolis yesterday they're you know they, they've been around in some form playing contemporary music since you know the, since top 40 on am as kstp they had a two-person morning show uh, sorry, two-person afternoon show, and it was actually um, the, the midday person filling in, so it was two women, and in between the hits, they were t talking about and taking calls on body image, <laughs> um, and, you know, it was 
fascinating, honest conversation. It was, you know, in between songs, including some that, you know, I don't hear all the time because, you know, because they were only hits, um, you know, in that market on that station. You know, and at that moment, you know, radio works fine. Um, you know, my radio is doing great. <laughs> um, and, you know, you have, you know, an owner that tries, you know, very hard, you know, to continue to do that type of radio. Okay. I will have to listen then. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are stations in Canada, there are stations in the UK doing that sort of, you know, full service personality radio where the, the records are basically something that come between listeners, you know, talking about bad plastic surgery or, you know, listeners talking about, you know, what's your favorite cookie or, you know, does pineapple belong on a pizza? Um, <laughs> Important uh, you know, subjects. My, well, and my favorite topic, you know, the, my favorite, you know, topic on BBC Radio 2 was, you know, have you ever done your own dental work? Um, and, you know, in the UK, you know, people who, you know, got tired of waiting for the national health, you know, did in fact, um, you know, couldn't get an appointment with a dentist. Um, you heard from people who did their, you know, who did their own extractions. You heard from one guy who took fiber fill and his home drill and did his own filling. You know, uh, I, I hope I he was successful at it. Not, yeah, <laughs> sorry. That, sorry. You know, if I've just made people squeamish, sorry. <laughs> but, Sean, uh, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I can always learn so much from you, and you're always welcome back anytime you want to talk about anything. Appreciate it. Was I concerned. hope it was better for people than dental work. <laughs> it better be, or I'm in trouble. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you, Ken. And thanks to all of you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. And I'll see you very soon with more interviews right here on this channel. Take care. Take care.